Uh, probably most of you know me from my, my Sun Tzu lecture. Uh, so it's like, hey, what's the Asia guy? What's the Chinese guy doing talking about organized crime? Well, most of my research agenda, most of my expertise is in fact in illicit economies, uh, organized crime, non-state security threats, and their convergence with modern forms of warfare. This is my latest book. This is Drug Trafficking and International Security. It came out in 2016. Uh, I really like this cover photo because that's pretty much what we do with your SRPs at graduation. <laughs> it's like, woohoo! See ya, suckers! Um, so yeah, take it right in front of Root Hall. <laughs> whatever, whatever that is, it's like 1201 graduation morning. It's like, oh, all done. And actually, I just looked up my Amazon rankings, so it needs a little help. I'm ranked at number 1,323,616, so I'm in the top 2 million, which is actually pretty awesome for me. Hey, just a warning, uh, today's noontime lecture is rated PG-13 for some strong images, some stronger language perhaps. I'll try to, try to keep it, uh, you know, keep it in, in check a little bit. Uh, some, of the, some of the photos are jarring, but uh, try not to worry. They won't be on the screen for too long. And it's not just to be an alarmist or to push things to the extreme, but to give you kind of a, a representation of what these groups uh, are, are capable of. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to start with the story of El Porvenir. El Porvenir is a small farming community in Mexico. You can see it way down at the bottom of the screen here by, with the letter A. In April 2011, 30 families from El Porvenir picked up as much as they could carry. They walked the 864 yards to the U.S.-Mexico border. You can see that wavy line right there as the border. They crossed the border. And then they went to another farming town, this one called Fort Hancock in Texas. And while they were there, they asked for asylum. And the reason they asked for asylum was three days beforehand, a drug gang hung a banner in the town square saying that unless each family paid $300 per child in protection money, then they couldn't guarantee their child's safety. And in what might be a rather ominous sign, El Porvenir is Spanish for the future. And with images like these occurring in parts of Mexico, you can understand why the residents of El Porvenir might have been frightened. Since 2006, over 200,000 Mexicans have perished in drug-fueled violence. By 2008, there were more beheadings occurring in Mexico than in Iraq and Afghanistan combined. And really, it's only been ISIS that has outstripped the Mexican cartels in the number and patterns of beheadings. So this is what I'd like to talk with you folks about today. I'd like to talk about what is organized crime. We'll begin with some definitions. Then I'd like to talk about what I call the five quote unquote laws of organized crime. How does organized crime actually work? How does this crime actually organize itself? Then I'd, of course, like to talk about what are the implications here for US national security? Why should we care about it as national security professionals? And then finally, what are the effects of organized crime on border security? Uh, and what I've done is I've kind of cobbled together a little photographic essay of my time doing field research along the US-Mexico border a few years ago. Um, not much has changed in the interim, uh, but of course this is a, a big topic. Uh, border security, build the wall, et cetera. So I think it's important to at least cover uh, what we can of that discussion. So definitions, clearing some of the, the underbrush, if you will. Organized crime. Well, organized crime can mean two things. The first definition is organized crime as a group. So a group of persons who possess the willingness and means to use violence to carry out large-scale and complex criminal activity for the purposes of enrichment or personal aggrandizement of power. So what are some examples? Well, right there, you've got Mexican drug cartels, the Italian mafia, the Japanese Yakuza, the Chinese triads, those would be considered organized crime groups. A second definition of organized crime would be the activities themselves, those complex criminal activities that generate power or profit. What could those be? Well, illicit trafficking, drugs, people, counterfeit goods. It could also be money laundering. So how do you actually take the dirty money that you've earned from illicit activities and put it into the upper world, as we call it, the legitimate economy. Another one would be shakedowns, protection rackets, which would be essentially selling a service that you don't need. So I'm going to sell you some insurance to make sure that your business doesn't burn down, except the only protection you need is from me 
perhaps burning down your business if you don't pay me the money. A final definition would be gangs. What are gangs? And this really comes from a work by Mike Davis. He wrote in the preface of uh, World of Gangs. Gangs are those groups that create power from the control of small urban spaces. So for example, street corners, slums, playgrounds, schools, prisons, garbage dumps. And they want to control kind of informal spatial monopolies that provide some measure of entrepreneurial activity and some local prestige as well and opportunities uh, for folks. So again, I, we could go on and on with a list of different street gangs and gangs, but some examples here, MS-13, Mala Sabotrucha Trece, the gangster disciples of Chicago, the Bakasi Boys in Nigeria, and various outlaw motorcycle gangs in the United States, in Europe, uh, as well as Australia. So those would be organized crime as well, uh, these gangs. So we spend a lot of time, as you know, at the Army War College and with comps coming up with Carl von Clausewitz. So these are some of the things that he's talked about. 19, you know, he's a 19th century soldier and theorist. War is an extension of politics by other means, fog friction. This is actually a photo of the bust of Clausewitz that's in the Bliss Hall foyer. The interesting thing about this is, is that plaque, which says Carl von Clausewitz, class of 1982. So. <laughs> He lived a long time, uh, this guy. He's a proud graduate of the Army War College. Uh, but what's interesting is in organized crime studies and gang studies, we don't have a Clausewitz. We don't have anybody who really wrote down their understandings of what they did or mused about their activities. So what I've had to do is I've had to kind of cobble together a bunch of different quotes from different organized criminals, if you will. So that's how I developed what I call the five quote unquote, quote unquote laws of organized crime. How do they work? So the first law comes from Meyer Lansky. Meyer Lansky was a, a Jewish American, Jewish immigrant who worked very closely with the Italian American mafia and the Sicilian mafia as it, as it uh, came to America. And he really put together the financial backbone of organized crime in the United States. And his first law comes from a quote where he says, hey, you find what a lot of people want but can't get then you supply whatever that is, and you shovel in the dough. So essentially, the translation here is organized crime is primarily a business. It's a business of generating illicit profit. Whatever might be illegal, highly taxed, overregulated, then what you do as an organized criminal figure is you provide that product or service. Internationally, what do most people want? Well, according to the United Nations, it's drugs. It's narcotics. Everybody's looking to get high. So these are some of the stats here. Illegal drugs between 300 and 500 billion dollars. If this economy, if that profit was located in one country, that country would be part of the G20. It would be located somewhere between Sweden and Saudi Arabia in GDP. And a lot of these, of course, are interrelated. So if you're trafficking in illicit drugs, you're probably also trafficking in weapons, small arms. And what we're also finding is endangered species trafficking is when a lot of these drug dealers go into certain places of Central America or South America and they establish runways, they find all these endangered species and they traffic them as well. Uh, so that's something. Art and antiquities theft. Now, a lot of people think that this might actually be going to private interests, private dealers, museums, but some of it is actually used as collateral for other illicit transactions. That if you've got a drug deal and you want to guarantee the price, or you want to guarantee that you're going to come through, you say, hey, I've got this Renoir. And you know pretty much exactly what it's worth. So that way you can guarantee that you're going to come through based upon your possession of that particular antiquity. Hey, law number two also comes from Meyer Lansky. And he said, look, Ford salesman don't shoot Chevy salesmen. Ford salesmen don't shoot Chevy salesmen. That in a lot of respects, violence is bad for business, especially if it's random violence. So what you want to do is you want to use direct and targeted violence. So they do use violence in a strategic way. And they really do it for five larger strategic reasons. Right? There's always what we would call the micro-social drivers of violence with these groups, which would be something akin to, hey, you looked at me funny, so I had to shoot you, or you wanted to take my girlfriend, so you had to die. Those would be at the very, very kind of low-level stuff. But why do these groups, as groups, use crime? 
or, or violence in their criminal activity. Well, the first big reason is largely what they're doing lacks trust. It's what we call the villain's paradox. How do you find trust in an environment where there is no trust, that is inherently trustworthy, untrustworthy? That how do I find trust with another criminal knowing that he's a criminal just like I am and he's looking at me like another criminal? This is a problem. So especially when it comes to enforcing a contract or an agreement. So let's say, for example, Mike in the back, Bronze Mike and I have an agreement over a shipment of cocaine that we'll keep it, we'll keep it simple. You're going to give me a kilo of cocaine, I'm going to pay you $10,000. Pretty, pretty simple. Well, that's, that's the point, right? Which is, that seems like a very simple agreement. But how could that actually end up being in dispute? What could go wrong? Yeah, quality of the cocaine. Hey, we agreed on 90% purity. I just tested it. It is not. It's like 86%. Therefore, I'm not paying you 10 grand. What could be another reason? Timely delivery. Timely delivery. Sure. Hey, we agreed yesterday was the day. You're giving it me, to me today. I can't use it today. I already, I already found another supplier. Mike might be, no, you're going to take this. We agreed on it, so you better take it. So when there is a disagreement in the illegal world, it's not as though we can go to court and have this dispute settled. You know, we can't go to a judge and say, hey, Your Honor, you know, we had this agreement over some coke, and uh, it kind of went bad. No, can't do it. So in the legal world, when there is a dispute between folks, between businesses, hey, those people are most often called litigants. In the illegal world where, is it, where there is a dispute, those people are most often called victims. The second reason is for internal security, and we're going to explore this a little bit later on as well. But let's say, for example, Mike is part of our little cartel or gang, so we're, we're a group now. But Mike, you know, in the past few weeks, he hasn't been kicking over quite as much dough as he does in the past. He hasn't been attending the meetings, so maybe we got a problem with Mike. You know, maybe Mike is working for the competition, you know, for another gang or another cartel. Or worse yet, maybe he's going to the cops. Oh, then we've got a problem. So what we need to do is we need to figure out what Mike has been up to and whether he's going to tell us the truth. So we're going to send like Moose and Rocco over to his house, give him a few shots, and say, what's up? And it might be that, hey, I've just had a slow week. This is, this is, this is a problem. Now, what could Mike be reasonably thinking after that? What might be a reaction? Better step it up, so he's been disciplined, so that's disciplining the workforce, as we would call it. Lack of trust. Lack of trust, yeah. He might now look at us and say, what the hell was that? You know, I've been with this group for seven years, seven years plus, and this is the way they treat me. I've had a couple of slow months, and they send Moose and Rock over to give me some shots. Screw them. So now, maybe Mike will go and work for the competition. Or maybe he will try to jump out of the gang and go to the cops. And now we've got a real problem. So we're going to have to send Moose and Rocco back for another time. One more time with feeling. And so we'll have to kill Mike. So Mike's last words that he will hear will probably be along the lines of, hey, Mike, hey, man, it's nothing personal. It's just business. And we'll mean it. The third reason is, as I covered, competition. Sure. So maybe another rival gang has seen that there's weakness here. And they can encroach in our territory. They can start shoveling dough in our ter or shoveling drugs in our territory, or pinching our folks, begin, beginning to like poach people who are really expert in areas that they need. Hey, we need an accountant, let's take that guy. So we've got to figure out a way to fend them off. And one of those ways would be to use, to use violence. The fourth one that we often overlook is succession issues within the gang or the organized crime syndicate. So let's say, for example, uh, I'm the godfather. No, I'm, I've been in charge of the organization, but something happens to me. Um, I get killed, natural causes, no, that, maybe that's okay. I get arrested, so suddenly I'm, I'm out of the picture. So the question becomes, who takes over after I'm gone? Well, it could be where we've made an arrangement. It could be, hey, I've said to John in public, in front of the group, hey, if something happens to me, John gets to take over. Well, I may have actually made a side deal with other Mike in private and said, yeah, I just had to say that to John because I really needed his support on one issue, but really, you're my guy. So if anything happens to me, you know, you're my guy. 
Or somebody else in the group might just create a story and say, no, actually, Paul told me I'm the guy. So there is not necessarily honor amongst thieves here. So what happens is internal factions form, rival cartels back one over the other, and you have this kind of split, splintering effect where folks begin to kind of peel apart. In many respects, some of this is what's occurring in Mexico, the, the kingpin strategy, where you take one of the big leaders of the cartels out of the equation and you have fights amongst the lieutenants for who's going to take over and who's going to give what to a rival, what rival is going to support what faction. Um, so the kingpin strategy, in some respects, actually will fuel the violence as well. The fifth one would be for prestige or reputation. That, yeah, we'll use violence for deterrence, and we'll also use violence because, honestly, don't we want to be the biggest, baddest gang out there? So if we are, we can kind of push back against folks without really having to push back that hard. They're already afraid of us. And it's also kind of cool. We often overlook the cool factor uh, for a lot of folks who join these organizations. It's like, yeah, I want to be part of the baddest. I don't want to be part of the weakest mob out there. So if somebody's going to come after us, they're going to cut the heads off six of our guys. Then we're going to find one of their lieutenants cut their face off and stitch it to a soccer ball and leave it in a national stadium, which actually did happen in Mexico. So, as I mentioned, yeah, this is what we see in Mexico. These killings have a message. So it's not just random violence. It's horrible violence, to be sure, but it's not random. So you can see here, if you cut somebody's hands off, you stole from the group, dismembering decapitation is rivalry, dismembered hands in the mouth, victim provided information to the cops. So law number three comes from Pablo Escobar who was one of the leaders of the Medellin cartel in the 80s and 90s in Colombia. And he had a simple rule, which was plomo or plata, lead or silver, lead of the bullet or silver of the bribe. And this is really how do you approach corrupting state agents. You actually need state agents at some point either to look the other way or to be in on it as well, to be on, in on the scams. So you give people a choice. What do you want? Do you want to get hurt or do you want to make money? And we can see this occurring within our own institutions here in the United States. You can, you can see where Border Patrol agents are being corrupted by cartels. You can see even some folks in the military are serving as hitmen, as informants. Uh, so this is problematic. We also have some evidence that cartels are intentionally trying to insert their members into law enforcement and the armed forces. It's not just turning people who are already there, but intentionally putting their own members in there to not just infiltrate and perhaps use the organizations, but to gain the skills so when they come out, they can be useful to their organizations as well. Law number four comes from Joe Bonanno. Joe Bonanno, also 1920s, 1930s, Italian-American gangster, worked with Meyer Lansky, uh, in fact, uh, especially prominent in New York, part of the five families. And his law was, hey, mafia is a process, not a thing. Mafia is a process, not a thing. The translation, what is it a process of? Generating internal cohesion or trust within the organization. That's super important. I just read a book called Mafia's on the Move by Federico Varese, who had just awesome resources. He got a bunch of research assistants to work in different environments from Italy to Russia and he poured over some of the intercepts, some of the wiretaps from Russian organized crime for a year and analyzed them, put them into kind of categories and this is what he found. He found that investments in the legal economy took up over 50 percent of the taped conversations. Resource acquisition would be things that you need as an organization to accrue these illicit resources, cell phones, weapons, you know, bribes, et cetera, of state agents. And then you see internal, maintaining internal order is about 20% of the com conversations. And then below that, the protection rackets I, I sort of mentioned. Hey, you got a nice place here. It would be a shame if, say, something were to happen to it. But of those four, right, three are really about procuring money and resources, about illicit profit while maintaining internal order is important as well. It's about, you know, what, 20% right there of what they are concerned with is, yeah, how do we actually keep this sucker together? Um, this is where you get tattooing. Tattooing is important as a type of internal trust builder. This is MS-13. So tattoos not only symbolize 
you know, your allegiance to the group and your demonstration of pride and tells you a little bit of the story as a uniform. For example, this guy on the right here, can't really see it from this distance, but above on his lip is a date, 15th August 2005. Of course, that's when he joined the gang. So that sort of lets people know. But this also, this tattooing, this elaborate tattooing, really it's difficult for law enforcement or others to infiltrate that gang if they don't have the right tats. It, it's virtually impossible. The other thing it does, it almost ensures loyalty to the group. So it just doesn't demonstrate it, but it's really difficult. If you've got MS-13 stuff all over you, to jump into a rival gang, let's say Barrio 18, because you just don't have the right uniform, and it's a permanent uniform. The other thing, of course, it guards against is you're being able to jump out and join the legal world. It's like, yeah, I'm tired of the gang life. I think I want out of it. Looking like that, I, you know, what, what do we think for him? You know, greeter at Walmart? I, you know, I don't think so. You know, pediatrician, maybe? Not sure. <laughs> yeah, not sure. <laughs> Law number five actually doesn't really come from an organized crime figure. It comes from the former governor of the state of Louisiana, Huey P. Long. And Huey P. Long said, one day the people of Louisiana are going to get a good, clean, honest government, and they're not going to like it. They're just not going to like it. So the translation is, hey, community support is also necessary for organized crime. So it's not just, hey, looking the other way when these things happen, but there has to be some benefit to what these people are doing for the larger community. And you can sort of see that in how these groups view themselves. They view themselves really as community providers and protectors, that they spend, quote unquote, more time hanging than they do banging hanging out with the community, hanging out with each other, rather than shooting it up or shooting up other folks. So a couple of examples here. On the left-hand side is a garment factory in San Salvador. So if you're a woman who works there and you don't have access to transportation because the bus routes are too dangerous, and one of the reasons they're too dangerous is because of gang activity, then MS-13 will provide you with a free shuttle or taxi service to and from your job or your occupation. On the right-hand side is a protest in northern Guatemala. It's a protest by people who live in that community against what the government of Guatemala did, which is arrest the Lorenzana family. The Lorenzana family, big-time drug traffickers, but they invested in the community. They had legal businesses. They had fruit businesses that employed many folks. So once they were arrested, that family was arrested, then this community was out of work. So they're protesting against the government. They're not protesting against the crooks, but they provided a benefit. So if you put all these together, these five laws, yeah, it's a business of illicit profit making, use of directed violence, corruption of government authority, need for a group cohesion, and community support acqui acquiescence. So how is this linked together, and how does it affect U.S. national security interests? Well, we know, for example, that terrorists use organized crime. So this is one very small example of Khalid Zarkani. Khalid Zarkani went by the gang nickname of Father Christmas Santa Claus in the Molenbeek neighborhood in Brussels. The reason he went by that name is because he was giving out a lot of goodies to the kids. He recruited kids into the gang. And he also made a lot of money that he used to send some of his acolytes to Syria to get training with ISIS. One of his acolytes was Abdul Hamid Abaoud, who was responsible, one of the quote-unquote masterminds of the Paris attacks in 2015. Also big drug runners of Captagon. Captagon is pretty much speed. Uh, they used that in Syria. They captured a lot of the factories and just kind of churned out a lot of speed. We know that nation states like Russia will use organized crime. So Russia actually not only nationalized organized crime under Putin, but has weaponized it as well. So in fact, there's kind of an error in the title of my talk. It isn't crime versus the dime. It's crime as the dime, where criminality is in fact part of statecraft. This is Sergei Aksayanov, who is a member of the Salem Group. The Salem Group in Crimea was an organized crime family. He went by the criminal underworld nickname of the Goblin. He helped assemble the quote unquote self-defense forces in Crimea that seized the parliament building and essentially midwifed, helped midwife Crimea into Russia, helped annex Russia. Never been through Russia before, never met Putin, but as a reward, he was made president of Crimea. So if you can nationalize it and weaponize it, North Korea has industrialized it. 
There is an entire part of the North Korean government, Central Committee Bureau Number 39, that is in charge of criminal enterprises. They're not the cops looking the other way. They're actually in charge of all these other things that are listed on this graphic. So from counterfeit goods, counterfeit money, drug running, they're the ones who actually take the profits, give it to the Kim family to dispense out to the elites, to keep the elites happy, to keep them loyal to the Kim regime, and also to fund their WMD programs. So here we can actually see the intersection of transnational organized crime and some pretty serious international security issues like WMD development and the preservation of a rogue, tyrannical regime. Okay, as promised, border security. Border security is hard. Um, photographic essay that I put together on my time along the border. Some of these photos I took myself. Some of these photos were sent to me afterwards by folks I, I talked to down there, FBI, ICE, um, even National Park folks. Um, some customs and border protection folks um, to, again, kind of get an up-close look at, at, at our border and the issues there. So I started my journey, the westernmost part of our border with Mexico. This is kind of San Ysidro Imperial Beach down around San Diego in California that borders uh, Tijuana. And as you can see, that border goes right into the Pacific Ocean. You may be able to see a little nub out there as well, and that's a gap in, in the fencing that the tides, of course, washed away. So if you come up from that beach, this is me in the, in the little border patrol vehicle, you can actually see what you can imagine as being solid border security. You have a paved access road, right? You've got cameras, sensors, you've got a fence with warnings, you've got concertina wire. Well, I was out with a border patrol supervisor uh, in the evening at a port of entry in uh, San Ysidro, San Diego, and he gets a call. He gets a call on radio, and it's, hey, we got a swimmer. I'm like, uh, okay, well, what's a swimmer? Well, you remember that part of the border I just showed you? Well, somebody from the Mexican side on a surfboard was trying to get around in the dead of night around the border, and he was having trouble getting onto the beach. He was an American guy, and the reason he was having trouble getting onto the beach is he had a lot of pot on him. Uh, he had to cut a bunch of it loose, but this is 10 pounds of waterproof pot in the evidence room uh, of the uh, Border Patrol station. Uh, that's about 10 grand right there. Uh, so you can understand why you might want to take the risk, I guess, of trying to surf around the border. From there, I went to Arizona. I went to Nogales around kind of the Douglas, Bisbee, Fort Huachuca area uh, to Coronado National Memorial Park where this sign is present. You can see it, smuggling and or illegal entry is common in this area due to the proximity of the international border. Please be aware of your surroundings at all times. Do not travel alone in remote areas. And of course, enjoy your picnic. Uh, this is same area. This is me to give you a kind of a, an aspect of what the fence looks like there. So that sign is a way back around those hills. And you can see this looks very different from the other portion of the border along San Ysidro. You've got a dirt road. These are really kind of slats, as you can tell by the shadow, so it's not really a solid wall at all or a solid fence. Um, and the rest is all kind of desert. And if you keep on going farther eastbound, that fencing gets more and more kind of ramshackle. So this is a cattle fence. Um, and then this is just a railroad, portion of railroad track from 1915 that some National Guard guys kind of just you know, put together. And, uh, and a tire iron right there, too, that was kind of welded to it, I, I guess, in sort of a sign of futility. Um, but, but even in sort of better parts of the fencing in this area, it doesn't mean that people aren't going to try to get over. So this is a contraption. If you look at it from the Mexican side, this is a truck with a ramp on it, um, which, yeah, gives you an idea there, there might actually be rednecks in, in Mexico as well. I have the great idea. Here's an idea. You know, we'll go ahead and just put a ramp on a truck. And then I guess somebody was going to go over that sucker with, with like an ATV with whatever, probably, you know, a load of drugs on the back. But um, something went wrong. They were caught by Border Patrol, and they said, see ya, we're out of here, uh, and left their, left their vehicle there too. But even attempts to get over the wall don't have to be quite as sophisticated. This is a catapult on the Mexican side. It's our Mexican military. You can see in the bottom there, those are bales of marijuana. So it's kind of a potapult that you just kind of, <laughs> you know, you just kind of launch the bales over, over the fence, and somebody's there waiting in a van or an ATV, and they're just kind of chucking it 
um, ready for distribution in the United States. So we've seen that you can get around the fence and that you can get over the fence, which also probably means that you can, you can get under the fence as well. So this is Nogales. Nogales is really one town separated by the border that just kind of goes right through it. So there's actually Nogales, USA, and Nogales, Mexico. Nogales, Arizona, Nogales, Sonora. And it's really common. People just go back and forth as a matter of routine each day. You can live on one side, work on the other side. You go to you know, relatives, quinceaneras, or church services on, the, on one side. I went to lunch on the Mexican side, a very easy, quick hour. Just go through that border crossing station towards the middle of the photo. Simple enough to do. Well, in downtown Nogales, they found near a parking meter the opening of a tunnel. So a lot of these tunnels don't have to be huge, huge. They can just be kind of a small opening like this. And the reason you have a tunnel like that is, well, you drive a vehicle that has a false bottom over it, and all the drugs go up, as you can see, and all the money and weapons just kind of go down and across into Mexico. Right, so concluding thoughts as we wrap up. Yeah, organized crime is, in fact, a powerful force that adds greater complexity, I think, to the international security environment that we as national security professionals need to be aware of that organized crime does shape many societies and U.S. national security in some profound ways. If you think about Russian organized crime, North Korea, uh, and even, even terrorist attacks. And so finding ways to understand organized crime, I think, is going to be a key part of the future when it comes to looking at um, you know, the strategic environment. Uh, and we've spent a lot of time in the last portion here talking about border security, hard fences, tunneling, people going over in contraptions, but this too is also a version of border security. It's people playing volleyball across the border. Uh, the port of entry is the Tecate tent, so you know, once there's change of sides, just go ahead and take your border control cards, grab a beer, and, and go to the other side. So it may seem a little frisbees for peace, but this in fact is also border security and perhaps a, a vision of, of what uh, we, can, we can strive to have between uh, the U.S. and Mexico in the future.